Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Hello to everyone. Thanks for coming today. Another Thursday. Today we have uh, Maria Paniu. She's a Ramon y Cajal researcher, and um, she today will uh, talk about the scaling of climate change impacts and uh, Doñana's biodiversity. And well, if you have a little bit brief bio from you, just uh, sure. You know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can try. So hi everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm, I'm really excited to give this talk in person. I gave a seminar a few years ago, it was online, so it was a bit weird. And probably it's also weird that I'm giving a second seminar so early, so, uh, so in so little time after my last one. But it was originally meant to present a postdoc paper that got delayed. And so instead I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> my, some of the research I'm doing now um, in uh, Doñana specifically, and I uh, started here as a Marie Curie Fellow in 2020, and then now moved on, uh, um, I've been a year now a Ram uh, Ramonica Hall uh, Fellow, and you know, um, increasingly focusing my research on uh, looking at some of the pathways in how climate change affects biodiversity, different components of biodiversity uh, in the national park here, uh, in the great Doniana area, actually. And those of you who know me also know that uh, I really love to talk about mechanistic forecasts and how great they are. Uh, but today I will actually talk about some of the ways we can implement them uh, using examples from Doniana. And uh, I also will not be talking about meerkats that I also always talk about. I'll be talking more about uh, predators and prey and shrubs and invertebrates, um, all uh, here, uh, found here regionally or locally. But uh, what is the fuss all about? Well, uh, we all know that uh, there are an increasingly more severe and much more interacting numerous global change drivers that affect uh, biodiversity across various scales of organization. And so we are faced with the challenge of um, how do we model the effects of global change on biodiversity? And one straightforward way to do it is through a linear effect, through just through um, directly modeling the effect uh, of interacting global change drivers on specific biodiversity metrics, which we typically uh, get through data aggregation. So we may, for instance, uh, get some mean abundances uh, to get uh, mean species ranges, so species, uh, yeah, species home ranges. Uh, we may get species specific traits, uh, functional traits, life history traits, uh, or just average uh, of different things such as survival, generation time, uh, all uh, average on the species level. This has advantages because this allows us to model a wide range of species uh, for uh, some of those for, for which for some of those we don't have enough data to do you know to do better models, so to say. But this has a huge uh, disadvantage, and that is that the processes we're actually interested in operate at a very different scale and not through aggregated averages. And this is something that's been described in this seminal paper uh, a few years ago and has been popping up in the literature and most recently in this paper, it just came out a few, uh, a few uh, days ago, on the importance of looking at mechanisms at, at the variability beyond the species. So uh, if we use an example of why disaggregation is important, we can use, for instance, the example of abundances, changes in abundances or population fitness. So uh, one thing is that species, so this, this average that we always assume in biodiversity research, species consist actually of individuals, yes, that vary uh, in their trait value. So the trait is an individual concept, really. And uh, this variation in traits of different individuals across the life cycle, across space and time, is uh, what leads to variation and different fitness components. So survival and reproduction and thereby population fitness. And so uh, if you look at this deer example here, what we may have is that we have uh, quite a few individuals of a certain, that have a certain trait distribution, uh, which then affects their survival or transition from juvenile to adult, also their reproduction. And uh, these traits are affected by climate change as well as the survival and reproduction directly. So we already have this one level of complexity that um, global change effects uh, have various pathways of getting to the population. And on top of that, populations of different species do not exist in isolation in a given site. We know that they interact with other species. Yes, And uh, these um, interactions can modify some of this pathway of these mechanisms 
of the life cycle responses to, to global change. And these interacting species are, of course, themselves also, also affected by, by global change. And what this essentially means that um, all this together gives us a, a measure of biodiversity, of, of relative abundance of different species in the community across time and space. But because these abundances change dynamically, because of all these interactions, they actually feed back to then affect interactions. Right? So we have dynamic feedbacks that generate and change biodiversity. And uh, this means that there are several mechanisms within all of this, uh, uh, this joint uh, feedbacks and, and processes that allow species to actually buffer uh, some of the negative effects of many global change drivers. You know, and not just, uh, so we're not just talking about cascading effects. So for instance, if uh, reproduction uh, of, for a population is bad in one year because of higher predation pressures, well, they may save energy to then have higher reproduction at a, um, a, in the next year. And this is a clear buffering um, mechanism that allows the population to persist right, in the short or long term. And this is something that we don't get by just directly looking um, at um, the effect of global change through a, through a simple linear line on biodiversity metrics, simply because the fitness components, the survivor, production, dispersal, scale non-linearly across various scales of organization to changes in abundances, right? And the changes in relative abundances of different species in the community. So, um, if you accept, okay, this scaling up, it's important to look at mechanisms to scale from maybe individuals to um, entire communities and uh, across the landscape. The question is then, how can we actually do this? Yes. And so one thing that I've uh, started to look at uh, when working here and, and with the data sets here in Doniana is to look at different modules operating at different scales and joining these together. So the first module that um, I always like to look at is the life history process, which is for me the trait mediated survival, reproduction, growth, and dispersal of, um, of uh, individuals and of populations. And basically what you see here is a simple, uh, um, simple linear, generalized linear model, right? You look at survival as a function of different uh, things that can affect survival, which can be a trait, climate, interspecific abundances, interspecific abundances, interactions. And uh, that's important, this, this relatively simple generalized model can actually operate across different scales because you can include the effects of time and space that operate um, uh, on, the, on the life history components, on survival in this case. And you can make these processes even more complicated, right? You can include physiology, you can include genetics, or you can simplify them if you don't have um, that good data to make it work. And then, of course, this uh, survival here, for instance, is incorporated into the life cycle of a species. So uh, to, to describe the transitions among different ages, given the fact that most populations are structured by ages or stages, right? Um, and so you have uh, here, for instance, juveniles, non-reproductive, and adults. Uh, they survive, they grow, they transition, and they reproduce. Yes, this is the, se the second level of this, of this module, is, is going from life history process to life cycle. And then if you know the distribution of different life cycle stages and uh, their trait values, you can actually multiply it by all these processes and get uh, and project abundance uh, in time, which then, uh, again, you can make this as complicated as you want, uh, expanding this or reducing the life cycle dynamics. And you can do these things for several species in the community. And if you have their, uh, if you know their abundances or have some uh, estimate of abundances at a given time point, you can then, you know, link all of this back to project several species in the community together in time and uh, in space if you know dispersal. Yes, and all of these are different models, modules that scale up. And so <clears throat> this may look uh, great uh, on paper, but many of you may say, okay, there's no way uh, we can do these types of things for the majority of species because we just don't have the data. Because we don't, you know, we don't know many of the things, uh, not even for single species or single populations and uh, never mind um, entire communities. And uh, so for the rest of the talk, I want to sort of talk about some examples uh, that I've been working on of how we can actually make it happen, how we can do the scaling up using various techniques 
and how um, useful it is to do so. So the first thing I want to talk about uh, is the predator-prey system, so the, the, the Iberian lynx and the rabbits. That's a fantastic sim uh, system to work on because uh, in climate change research, because uh, rabbit uh, declines in rabbit populations are strongly associated with reduced fecundity of the lynx. We all know that because they're highly specialized on predating rabbits. And uh, rabbits uh, themselves are highly dependent on good green pastures, which are projected to be uh, severely affected by climate change in the future, which means that the rabbits will fare badly, and this is something that's already been shown. But uh, since the study that scaled from rabbits to lynx, much has happened, really. So the lynx um, are doing a bit better than in the 2013 study. So they are distributed in more, in more sites, in more areas um, in, in southern Spain. Uh, and uh, we now have the ability to fit demographic models for rabbits on a seasonal and monthly scale, instead of uh, averages over years, as has been done here. And this gives us better, a better idea of the actual bioclimatic variables that matter for the rabbits, right? So instead of using annual averages, we now have monthly availab availability of food, monthly maximum temperatures, and so forth. And with this, <coughs> so if you go back to the scaling up, so what we did is that we, uh, there is uh, very little data <coughs> of, uh, I, I'm not even sure if there's any data, that people systematically followed for several years the, um, the rabbit and the lynx together, and certainly not uh, across all the areas uh, where the, they co-occur, right? So we don't have individual level data. Um, as for instance, there, um, you may know from, uh, from the Canadian lynx, where there's this joint monitoring of individuals, of rabbits and lynx and so forth. So we don't have it here. But what we do have is a really, really good piecemeal information about different components of the system. So for instance, we have a very good idea from this paper of the life history processes of rabbits and of the rabbit life cycle. And so we got the parameters and we pulled the data uh, from, uh, from, this, uh, from this paper to parameters the life cycle of the rabbit. Uh, an important thing in this life cycle is that we know how rabbits, uh, how their, specifically the reproduction of rabbits, responds to uh, various environmental drivers. And we can then use uh, publicly available models, in this case, uh, global circulation models by the IPCC, to then you know, um, uh, model the vital rates of rabbits as a function of these variables and project into the future, more importantly. And uh, this is, for instance, maximum temperatures, ma ma monthly maximum temperatures. And you can see that they are projected. So this is the historical range uh, until 1919 to 2006. And uh, after this, uh, there's projections. And you can see that on average, temperatures are projected to increase. And this is occurring uh, pretty much across all the area of the, of the rabbit and the lynx system. And for the lynx, again, we also have very good data on uh, the demographic rates across different life cycle stages. And importantly, we know uh, quite well of how to link uh, the rabbit to the lynx. And this is basically done on a threshold. So if the rabbit densities <coughs> per hectare decrease to a certain amount, to a certain threshold, the lynx cannot uh, reproduce anymore and um, uh, ca cannot stay in a given territory anymore. So there's more less reproduction, more dispersal of the lynx, which both de de which decrease the survival. So the, the, because dispersal survival is higher, uh, as dispersal survival is lower than survival of the local, of the local lynx, right? So we know exactly how the, how the rabbits affect the lynx. We can scale this, these uh, life history processes from the literature to the population because we know the abundance of these different species in the uh, core areas in which they occur. And then we can also scale this uh, to, the, to uh, the landscape because we have an idea of connectivity, of how they are, you know, how they disperse within and also how the links disperse within and, and between the areas. And so I had a wonderful uh, master student who's worked on this model and what she did is she actually parameterized a joint rabbit links individual based models. So we have individual uh, survival, reproduction, movement, and so forth. Uh, first for the rabbit, and then mm, that changes the density of the rabbit, and then the lynx react to it. And uh, the model included uh, a, 
a lot of different uh, factors uh, which uh, give us quite a lot of room to create different scenarios you know, of what, if, what happens if you perturb this, if you perturb that. But um, in the baseline without much perturbation, so the, the key results that uh, Sarah found was that um, the extinction probability of both rabbits and the lynx increases under climate change. So we have a baseline scenario where we assume that climate change or the climate will not change farther than has occurred thus far. And we have a future scenario where the climate change continues and both the rabbits and the lynx um, are um, uh, 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 increasing their extinction probability. And uh, this also may be determined uh, whether the area in which they occur is um, smaller or higher than 100, 000, 100 square kilometers. Uh, one thing that you can notice that um, the the lynx, so the probability of lynx extinction is actually relatively a bit higher than for the rabbits. And this occurs because of stochasticity, so demographic stochasticity. So the nice thing about the IBM is that you have, uh, you, uh, you basically you, you may have, for instance, 10 individuals and you just randomly sample a zero one for their survival based on the given mean probability determined by temperature, prey availability, whatnot. But just this random sampling, the stochasticity, may lead to, to an extinction uh, by bad luck. And the fewer individuals you have, the, the higher is this likelihood that this will happen, right? And so th this is a nice part of this mechanistic model that you can account for this relatively easy uh, through simulations, right? So you, you, you can assume uh, that there's just by bad luck, um, uh, if the populations decrease to a certain level, uh, we may see um, local disappearance. But one thing that the model didn't have uh, of Sarah is that there was no real dispersal among the main areas. So within, the links could move, but not among the areas. And so we got uh, Anna Morales on board, uh, who uh, is, uh, she's doing a PhD with us, and um, uh, she's really good at making spatially explicit <laughs> individual-based models happening. And so she actually then started implementing uh, connectivity among the different areas of the links, right? And you basically see here again the same, the same sort of results, but a bit blown up. So you have here the extinction probability of the two species again. But now you see, so you have the historic scenario, so no climate change. You have two climate change scenarios, the RCP 4.5, so um, medium, let's say, climate change, and really intense climate change. Uh, and you have this also split by the different um, global circulation models that the IPCC uses, so different um, approaches to model climate change, let's say. But uh, so you see again, uh, generally, or not for all models, but generally the rabbit um, increases in extinction as does the lynx in under climate change. But the nice thing is that uh, before, in the plot I showed you before, the average probability of extinction for the lynx was about uh, um, 0.6, so 65%. But if you include connectivity, and this is, by the way, like minimum connectivity, this is the connectivity that's uh, currently known that's not very good among the areas because we know that there's quite little movement, actually, among the main areas. And so just with this minimal connectivity, we already see a better picture, a better future for the links. Yes, because they can move in and out of the area. And uh, <coughs> what, so, so this type of scaling up approaches uh, allows us to really um, see the, the main pathways, mechanistic pathways of how, in this case, climate change may affect um, a, a important system, important component of the system. And importantly, it can allow us to ask a lot of what if scenarios, right? Because there's so many parameters and you can perturb all of them and create realistic uh, scenarios. So for instance, what happens if the rabbits actually adapt under climate change. So they don't, they don't, uh, they're short-lived species, it's very well likely that they actually may adapt to changes in, um, in, in, in uh, vegetation. Uh, they may change their phenology. Uh, so meaning that we just, in the model, we can assume that the rabbit never goes extinct, right? The rabbit can also um, disperse into new area once there's local extinction, which is also likely. And we can use these types of scenarios to uh, create better management for both the rabbit and the lynx. And that's only possible through these types of uh, data integration approaches. Okay, uh, both rabbits and lynx actually depend 
on shrub habitats to survive, on the patchiness of different habitat types, uh, which includes the, the shrubs in Doniana and elsewhere. And uh, this is another system that I've been working on in Doniana. And here's another method of how we can integrate across uh, these different scales of organization. And so what we have here is a classic data set that uh, probably many of you are familiar with is that, you know, um, uh, counts of individuals of different uh, life cycle stages. So uh, measured through time. It's very common in using vegetation surveys, right? In this case, it is a work that started in 2007 by researchers from the CREAF, uh, where they've gone to the field um, after the severe drought in 2004-2005, hydrological year, and they've been measuring the um, uh, resilience of the shrub communities to this drought event until it's still ongoing. And what they did is they basically measured in 18 plots the relative abundance of uh, different life cycle stages of, the, of all the shrubs in there. So that's a pretty incredible data set already. And I actually uh, joined the team in uh, 2019, so right before I, I came here. And <laughs> Paco back then told me, well, are you you're so close to Doniana anyway, we should just, just uh, get on board with this, with this study system that we have. And, the, and that turned out to be um, a, a lot of luck for me. And it's, it's, um, it's a really great system because we are currently seeing huge effects of climate change, of land use change and the shrub communities. And in fact, how the shrubs may expand their ranges into other types of habitats. So what do we do? Uh, how can we scale up if you only have abundances? How can we get to life history processes? So the latent state approaches here are quite uh, interesting and quite cool to work with. What this means is that in this case, I used abundances of five species that were, more, that were the most abundant and gave me the less issues in the models, basically, <laughs> and uh, uh, across 18 sites. And I, you know, we had abundances of recruits, of saplings, and of adults. And I put them into the model and I told the model, OK, I want you to, from this abundance data and from some previous knowledge we had on other parameters, so on reproduction, uh, I want you uh, to estimate these vital rates for me. Yes, so it's, um, it's a latent state. It's an unobserved state, uh, but we can infer it more or less um, accurately from abundance data and previous information. And we can validate also, we can validate this, uh, whether this makes sense, the output that we get through simulation. You know, whether you can simulate data that you want and you tell it uh, and you can see whether it recovers the parameters. And in this case, it worked. And uh, the other cool thing is that these parameters, mainly survival, we modeled actually for all the five species as a function of intraspecific density, interspecific density, and uh, an effect of the main environmental driver, uh, in this case, rainfall, winter rainfall. And <coughs> because we did this for all the species simultaneously, we, can then, we could then join them, right, in a dynamic modeling framework where uh, under rainfall, the abundance of the species changes, which then changes the interactions and so forth. So <coughs> by doing so, we could simulate the pathways of reduced rainfall effects on these communities. And we did this uh, in two ways. We, either, we said uh, either rainfall affects only a focal species, and the other species I have no idea about. I just do some scenarios. I assume that their abundances change, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, or their abundances stay as they were in the past or as they are now, you know, which is actually the classical thing you do in many population ecology studies. You have your focal species, and you don't know anything about the neighbors, what happens to them under climate change. Or we did a fully dynamic, fully mechanistic scenario but climate change affected all the species simultaneously. And then they changed in abundances, which changed species interactions and so forth. And what we got when we did this fully dynamic approach, actually our ability to predict dynamics two years ahead, so for 2022 and 23, uh, were much better, right? And the other thing is that uh, depending on whether we use a dynamic or non-dynamic approach, it actually really um, affects our interpretation of what may happen to these communities under climate change. So here you see changes in mean abundances um, across <coughs> different um, sites. These are standardized values, so you don't need to uh, worry about uh, the, the actual numbers, but just the relative differences. And they are given for all the five species we modeled, and they're given for whether we used a dynamic in red or no dynamic scenario. 
You can see already uh, uh, everything varies depending on what scenario we use. And the most variation we get in this in Rosemary, which is the longest lived and the most robust pieces in these, in these systems, right? So what's going on here? So uh, Rosemary actually uh, doesn't care about rainfall, or at least the, the rainfall measure that we did. Doesn't, didn't seem to be much affected. What Rosemary, because it's very long lived, it can buffer climate change or climate effects. But what Rosemary really cares about is intraspecific and interspecific densities, both decreasing its uh, adult survival. And adult survival being a key vital rate for the species. When we assume no dynamic scenarios, so the other species are not affected at all by climate change, it seems that um, Rosemary really like put, picks up in abundance because we're just sort of projecting the current observed dynamics, which is uh, that it's, it's overcrowding you know, the, the, uh, the other species in some of the plots. But when we include the, uh, uh, the effects of rainfall and the other species that it interacts with, what happens is that some of these species actually increase in abundances under climate change because they are um, better to, to um, improve their niche under these climatic scenarios. And this means more competitors for rosemary, so not such a huge increase. So um, <coughs> that's um, um, quite an interesting result if you want to understand and project into the future how um, climate change may affect uh, not only the, the persistence of these species now in the current communities, but also their expansion into new habitats. And we can do so, we can scale from uh, this population modeling approach here to the landscape uh, by actually using uh, some of the really cool information that we have here, which is from, the, from GIS, or so repeated uh, pictures of, um, uh, of abundances of different shrub species across the landscape in Doniana. And also uh, through a collaboration with the University of Sheffield, where we have uh, a student who comes and measures um, abundances and reproductions and so forth of um, alimium and of lavandula um, across, uh, across the entire area of Doniana, basically, across all, all its abundance ranges. So this is something we're currently working on. Now, the uh, shrubs themselves are affected and affect invertebrates in the system. So the, the third part of my talk. Doniana has a huge uh, diversity of invertebrates <laughs> that's very well known, especially when I, when I talk to uh, <laughs> some of you about this. But the thing is that much of it is relatively understudied, and especially the effects of global change on invertebrates remain underexplored, which may have effects um, on things like dispersal of the, sh of the shrub species and so forth, or the survival of the seedlings, where the invertebrates are often key. And I was fortunate to get uh, um, Hanna Seridiok in, uh, in, my, in my team as a postdoc. And she's a specialist on lace wings. And here in this case, uh, we had uh, no idea about um, any abundances uh, in Doniana of lace wings. We didn't, we didn't know anything about the life history stages. We didn't even know how many exist, really. So what did we do? Well, we looked at the literature in general what is known in general about lace wings um, in, in, in the literature, right? And how uh, their different uh, life history responses so survival, developmental time simultaneously respond to a key uh, component of global change uh, temperatures, increases in extreme temperatures. And we also complemented this with some lab studies. We looked through, or Hannah mainly looked through a lot of literature and she found information on 83 species. Not a lot, but um, it, is, it is what it is. It's good enough, <laughs> more than we expected. And we then scaled this basically to then get to the population landscape. We implemented some monitoring, some capture of, of uh, lace wings in Doniana, actually using uh, malaise traps. But uh, we have to expand this now in, the, in this year uh, to really get proper abundance estimates. So far, we only got more or less occurrence and um, diversity. But uh, Let's get back at the literature review. So um, what we did here is uh, from all the studies of all the individuals, uh, all the data that we got, we did basically the maximum possible data disaggregation. So we didn't, we didn't just look at species average responses to anything. We actually put everything together. So individual responses, population responses, whatever we could find 
into multi multivariate generalized linear models, which allows you for maximum disaggregation of data. I don't want to go into detail uh, on the modeling, but uh, one interesting thing that we found is that, uh, for instance, the developmental times of the instar stages in the pupae, so here, decrease with, uh, uh, decrease with temperature, yes. So the hotter it is, the faster these things develop. Makes sense. And actually, it's also well known that the faster they develop, the higher they survive, because they, they are exposed to less predators in the soil or whatnot. But uh, it turns out that actually survival from pupae to, uh, to the adult stage, as well as the reproduction, uh, has a, is, is negatively affected at high temperatures, right? So uh, this uh, maybe is not that obvious because we used a uh, limited number of data points here because we modeled all of this jointly. But if you just look at this rate, we have more data points and this relationship becomes uh, clearer. So you have a, a peak survival and peak reproductive output, which is at the optimal temperature of like 25 degrees, but then it decreases afterwards. So uh, we, with this, we know that there's basically a trade-off under climate change potentially of uh, uh, lace wings being able to develop faster, but they don't survive necessarily better, right? And that's, and that's quite important, which means that this is an important fact of why, for instance, um, these populations don't increase in abundance even though uh, we would assume from simple principles, well, they, they should develop faster and they should survive higher, they should survive more. But it's not, it's not that simple. We can use this all uh, to put into a life cycle model. And uh, we could uh, use um, the abundances of different species in Doniana to sort of then project this model. And we're working on that. But one thing that I think uh, is really, really cool, and I mean, uh, I cannot stress enough how, how great it's been to work with Hannah, is that uh, she actually, uh, from the Malay traps, she identified or she described 22 species for the first time in Doniana. Never been described. That's super, I think that's, that's uh, uh, super interesting. And now the second step is to look which of these are more abun most abundant and how we can model this. But just this is fantastic. And this guy I'm pointing out because it's beautiful. <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. And also because uh, I can uh, confirm that uh, Hannah caught this guy because I actually saw her with a vial and she was, I remember she was freaking out because oh, she was so happy to see it because it was the best, uh, it was it's so beautiful. But anyway, so uh, there is just, you know, there is so much room uh, to improve our understanding of uh, different components uh, of systems and drylands and Nunyana more generally. The whole uh, my master plan is to integrate all of this together, right? So shrubs, changes in shrubs can affect rabbits, can affect lynx, invertebrates interact with shrubs. Yes, for instance, the larvae of these guys, the ant lions, they eat ants, but ants are important for seed dispersal. So these types of, you know, these types of interactions we can all model. Uh, we actually have a lot of computational power. I think it used to be limited by computational power, now we have it, <laughs> because we have the fantastic uh, supercomputer services here. So we can just uh, you know, go ahead and, and create all our possible scenarios. And one thing that I'm also working on is we, we are expanding this, um, this predator-prey uh, interactions to different species, to include more species and look at connectivity across the great area of Doniana. So not just National Park, but you know, to connect it to Sierra Morena and such. And we're doing this uh, through, a, through Natura Connect, um, a European project. And also now I'm starting uh, to dip a bit into dung beetles. Uh, with the Plan Nacional that I just had granted. Uh, if there are dung beetle experts among you, please contact me because <laughs> I know a lot about population ecology, but dung beetles are mysterious to me still. So, uh, we hope, so I'm trying to understand uh, whether this fa can facilitate shrub expansion under climate change. And uh, with this, ah, no, <laughs> the conclusion slide, I forgot. So why does this all matter? Right? What, what's the point of all of this? This upscaling, this, all these complicated mechanisms. So it matters because um, if you integrate data and you do upscaling, we can actually uh, say, we can do dynamic forecasts. And you can say, when do we need action? Not just, oh, we need action. We can say when we need it. And uh, where, in what specific location, perhaps. And we can create a lot of scenarios of how can we do the action? And what is the best way to do it? much more than if we just linearly model um, our global change effect on biodiversity. And with this, I would like to thank you all. 
thank all my collaborators that I haven't mentioned the talk specifically and spe uh, also all the volunteers that helped us collect data. These are invaluable. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Maria, <laughs> to share with us all the scientific enthusiasm. Now we pass with um, questions that you have. Okay. <laughs> As you're expanding to new taxa, have you considered uh, including some of the birds that also ah. prey on the rabbits? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think the, the data sets that have the abundance data sets are a gold mine. And uh, I've, uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I've actually talked to Andy Green, for instance, to include some of, the, of, of his work. Yes, yes. I think uh, for my personal part, I'm just not very comfortable with birds because I've never modeled them. <laughs> but I'm very interested, yeah, yeah. Okay, very, very, very ambitious and very interesting anyway. Uh, but I think that, uh, in my opinion, to probably to know the drivers, the causal drivers, not the phenom phenomenological approach you, yeah. are, you are using. For instance, in the third part, you discover that the developmental rate increased with temperature. Yeah. And the fecundity is not so. Yeah. It has a, 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 a nonlinear and mm -hmm. optimal in the, in the middle of temperature. Mm -hmm. But this probably is based by the by the the size size temperature rule, which means that uh, a higher temperature you have l a speeder or m uh, faster yeah. development, but a smaller size, yeah. and small and the size is quite important for fecundity. So these causal things or this approach more related to to the basic mechanisms of life history yeah. organism especially in ectotherms, yeah. may explain some way yeah. this disparity <laughs> in the relationship between yes. temperature and yes, yes, yes. your fitness rate, your measuring. Yes. But anyway, I think it's, it's interesting you co also I could include these yeah. uh, functional yeah. approaches. Uh, I'm actually sad that you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you're telling me to look at life history because that's what I do. I'm the li I, I actually I look at life history. I just didn't mention it because I don't want to keep talking about life history. But actually, um, this let me go do it like this. Uh, the uh, the life history. So modeling the life histories and putting them into a life cycle. So say this part, right? <coughs> that already that here we can include life history trade-offs very easily, right? So they, and um, in fact, one slide I didn't show, we actually did this for the invertebrates. We, so uh, we modeled uh, their responses to temperature and we used the residual of this model to create life history, life history access to see whether there's uh, inherent trade-offs, for instance, in there. So we, we did that. And then we have Hannah, she's a specialist on the actual physiological mechanisms that can be included uh, when we parameterize the life cycle models. So it's absolutely possible and, and I completely agree. And then, and uh, yes, thank you for pointing it out. I so uh, this trade-off, the idea of trade-offs is key here in life history strategies, yes. Thank you, Maria. Um, are you considering to take into account the seed bank <laughs> for the plants? Yes, uh, the seed bank, yes. Uh, it's the, what do they call it, is the, is the, the secret rule of all population ecologists, ignore the seed bank, basically. Nobody knows about, yes, uh, that's actually um, another um, experiment we're planning on doing, uh, is to uh, understand the seed bank dynamics of some of the shrubs, <coughs> which we for now are ignoring, but we know they exist, it's important, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Maria, thank you for that. Um, so I was going to ask about the kind of like grand vision and like putting all of these things together. Um, is there not a danger that it becomes a kind of chaotic modeling scheme? So, you know, with so many interacting species and drivers that co-occur together, including life cycles and scaling up to landscape, um, is there not a danger that it becomes very well, impossible to, pr to forecast and predict. Um, 
and <laughs> based on that is there a do you i mean i guess it comes down to within each module of the system like isolating what's important yeah. in terms of its drivers i just yeah i just wondered if you'd thought a bit about how that might go because it you know it comes yep. for example in the shrubs it's important to have the kind of accounting for the intraspecific dynamic interspecific yep. dynamics and stuff but like yeah how do you see that <laughs> playing out with the <coughs> whole system so uh, what you call chaotic i call digital twin <laughs> <laughs> so there is um uh, i think the, the the there's less and less limitation of um say computational power to make this happen the limitation is of interpretability that i completely agree with yeah. uh, but it's like you say um uh, i like I, I like to uh, i like the idea of always starting simple and then expanding as needed yes so for instance for the for the shrubs we had the abundances we expanded to the life cycle dynamics we can make but um uh, depending on the question you have you can then uh, increase your complexity and you can compensate by perhaps fixing certain things you know that don't matter I can also contribute to that thinking that uh, most of those feedbacks are negative trade-offs, which tend to buffer the dynamics. Yeah, yeah. So even if you expand the system and increase the complexity, you get a, a buffering, uh, an increased buffering as, uh, as, as it grows. The key here is identifying the, the positive feedbacks, which are the, uh, the, for the, the, the the trade-offs that are more more critical in in this kind of uh, of questions. <coughs> so it's not really problematic, even when you include uh, another layer of co of complexity like like the seed bank or diseases, for example. In the case of rabbits, can also be very important. Mm. So there are there are many levels of uncertainty or or ignorance, I would say. But the whole thing works. Work it works in the in the field. So it, it's dampened, it's buffered uh, by default. So, yeah, I mean, uh, um, I agree. I, I do think that negative feedbacks are uh, important to understand because I think that uh, uh, that sometimes we don't we underestimate the ability of natural systems to actually buffer, and because we don't understand it well, we cannot uh, create scenarios of how to mitigate certain effects because we don't understand like the, the intrinsic buffering mechanisms that are there. Uh, uh, but <coughs> I do agree also with John that there is an issue. The, the simple issue is of adding more parameters. It becomes difficult to interpret them, but I, um, I, it's not. You just, if you do it carefully, I don't think it's a limitation. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah more specific question now. Sure. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, can you go back to the links in the rabbit example under yes. the connectivity scenario? Yes. You had some inversions in the effect, I think. And I have. My question. Wait, ah. Maybe not, but yeah, if you go to that slide. The extinction one? Yeah, under the connectivity <coughs> scenario. The conne like the, the slide of the this one here or what? The Wait. No, 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 no. Uh, when you see the, the dynamics under ah, the different yes, climate so scenarios. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that I one. I got it, this one, yes. Ah, don't so go. Wait, there we go. So in the links, for example, in the second plot, you see kind of a decrease, right? Yeah. Instead of an increase. And That's there's lots of variation in there. Yes. So, so can you explain why you do you have so much variation in there, some of the including inversion of effects? Mm. Some, of the climate, some of the GCMs are not great, for instance. So like one we had to kick out because it wasn't giving realistic... Um, so the, the climate models themselves weren't giving uh, realistic examples. Um, I, I haven't really gotten into... Uh, into the details, I, I don't, uh, it may just be that, for instance, you can see here that there, uh, it's driven by the rabbit dynamics. And something in this model is making, for, uh, for some of the populations, or some of the areas, all the rabbits go extinct, right? Which um, is, um, so yeah, it's a problem of the model. Basically, uh, the temperature values that the model gives me are beyond the range that's reasonable, which is a common problem in climate change scenarios, by the way. That I encounter is always like you, you fit your model into one climate, you change the uh, temperature by one degree, everything either goes extinct or explodes. So that, that's that. That's, that's the reason, I think, uh, is that this particular model mm -hmm. is not uh, doing great. And so we have to check the actual temperature value. Okay, cool, thanks. 
Well, you have this up and thinking about what Eloy was saying. When you include the other species, do these numbers moderate? They seem very high to me. Yeah, yeah, they're very high because, um, why are they very high? Well, because uh, uh, we, don't, um, we, we don't have any reintroductions that have been, or like, what do you call it? What is what they call not um, continuous re, re, re pumping of links into, <laughs> and we don't have the rabbits also, um, if they go extinct, they just stay extinct, but that's also very unlikely, so that, that's why. So we're improving, uh, so we need to improve these types of, uh, the, uh, these models. Have you made this kind of calculations after including like the shrubs and the other? No, not yet, components? not yet, not yet. But that, mm, no, that, although that I don't, um, I'm not sure whether this will improve or actually worsen the situation. Oh, you know, probably worsen, <laughs> but <yeah. laughs> that, that, I don't know. Let's see. Hopefully the buffering kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? No? Gonna check. Ah, yes, is. online. So, <laughs> online? No, o online? No, YouTube. No, okay. no? No, 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 no. questions for today that I sometimes jump it. Um, if anyone has any questions, so thank you for coming and giving uh, this discussion. It's been very interesting. Thank you. And uh, thank to you. Thank you all <laughs> very much. It's interesting.